In today's video, we're going to install this Saturn overdrive onto the back of a Spicer 18 transfer case. This transmission and transfer case combo came out of a 46 CJ2A, but it works in many other models as well. I'll put that info in the description. This unit is described as an all-range overdrive. The planetary housing replaces the output gear of the transmission, and what that means is that this overdrive will work in forward, reverse, um, high range, low range. This particular unit will give you a 25% reduction in RPM anytime it's engaged, and you also have the option of splitting gears, so you have sort of a half gear if you're on a hill or something and you need just a little bit more or less RPM. However, the procedure does not change. Although it's not completely necessary, I recommend draining and flushing the transfer case at this time. The overdrive is a big investment and you want to protect it as much as you can. So simply remove the drain plug on the bottom of your transfer case, drain all the oil out, and you'll be good to go. More than likely, your transmission will be in your vehicle still, so you'd start by removing the shift knob and the transmission cover. Once you do that, put your transmission in gear, transfer case in gear as well to hold everything still while we remove some parts. For the next step, you gotta take a 916 socket and remove all five bolts on the PTO cover. Once you have all five bolts off, remove the PTO cover. This exposes the transmission output gear, cotter pin, and retaining nut. If your transmission has a rear PTO already installed, you'll have to remove the PTO shaft or belt or whatever you're running, and it's the same procedure. Remove these five bolts and take the PTO unit off the back of the transfer case. There are a few different style retaining nuts on the Spicer 18. This is probably the most common. It just has a simple cotter pin and a nut. There are um, some people who replace them with a nylon lock nut. Just wrestle this thing out of there. Try not to drop anything down inside the case if possible. Up next, you're going to need an inch and 5 16 socket to remove the retaining nut. It's totally acceptable to use an impact gun, but for removal purposes only. Once the nut is removed, be careful, there is a washer. It's a good idea to use a magnet to help because you don't want to drop anything down inside your transfer case. There's the washer. After that, just grab the back of the gear. You'll have to rotate it slightly as it comes off. It's a helical cut gear, and there it is. Before you order your overdrive unit, I would recommend getting to this point in the process because you want to count the teeth on the output gear and the splines on the output shaft of the transmission. There are a few different options and you want to make sure you get the correct one for your application. First thing to check is the splines. Most of these old willies use a six spline. Um, ten spline was also another option, so count your splines. The uh, six spline is the more common coarse spline output shaft. The other thing to check for is tooth count. There are 26 tooth and 29 tooth output gears. So you want to make sure you know which one you have. There are numbers. Uh, this is a 26 tooth. The numbers are 18-8-19. This is a 29 tooth. The numbers are 18-8-23. But I always um, kind of foolproof it by actually you know, putting a mark on a tooth and just physically counting them. So most of the older CJs are six spline, 26 tooth, but always check before you order so that you get the right unit. Once your output gear is off, this is what you should see. It's just a bare spline. You can see the bearing. Kind of inspect everything. Um, check to make sure your rear output bearing is still usable. And I always like to uh, wipe off and clean the splines. Make sure the nut spins on and off freely. So if you have any burrs or anything on that, this threads would be a good time to take care of that and just kind of inspect the rest of the teeth in your transfer case and make sure there's no goop or chunks or anything like that just kind of uh, common sense stuff now on to the fun part reassembly this is the bowl gear it houses the planetary and replaces the output gear so this is our 26 tooth you can see it's stamped right there so this matches the output gear we removed perfectly so I like to take a rag and wipe off the splines. Make sure there's no dust or dirt or anything, especially if you've had this open for a couple days while you're waiting for your parts to get there. Then I like to take a little bit of clean um, oil of some sort, Marvels, WD-40, just something to kind of lubricate those splines and threads. Now we are ready to install the bowl gear. 
This is the orientation that it goes in. So the gear portion goes towards the transmission. Gently slide it in here, trying not to bang it off anything. You are gonna have to line up the splines and the teeth on the gear. So just give it a little wiggle. It should slide right in, very little effort. If it's not going in smoothly like that, to where you feel a thunk, that it's seated in properly, you need to stop and uh, pull it back out and make sure there's nothing getting in the way. Inside the bowl gear is a square drive. It simply uses a half inch drive on your socket extension. So slide that right in there. I like to start this by hand. So we're actually threading. There's a nut that's captured inside there uh, with a washer and an O-ring. So you'll feel it start and grab by hand. Once you know it's threading on there properly, just get a ratchet. Do not use an impact gun on this. This should be done by hand only. Continue to tighten the nut. It should be smooth um, with a pretty consistent feel all the way down. Eventually, you will feel it bottom out, meaning it will just act like it hit a brick wall, which it's hitting a metal shaft, so that's good. Once you get it there, that means it's seated all the way in and we're not going to torque it until we're all done with our measurements in case we have to remove it. This is the only critical measuring part of this installation process is measuring the difference between this surface and this surface. I'll show you both ways you could measure it. Um, this is not something you can do with a tape measure and a ruler. You need some sort of precision measuring instrument. So I'm using a depth mic right here and I'm making sure to push firmly so that it's contacting both sides of this um, synchronizer ring or synchronizer cone. The bigger the depth mic, the better for this. This one's about as small as it can be and still work well. So we're looking for a measurement of 0.677, so that's 677 thousandths. Whenever you're using a micrometer, um, you don't want to twist it very hard. You're using fingertip pressure. Some micrometers will click when they get to the right pressure. So just till it touches and pull the micrometer off and check it. I'm at 675 right on the nose. Um, so we're within two thousandths of the required measurement. I'm also going to show you how to do this using just a basic dial caliper and a straight edge. The most critical thing here is that your straight edge is indeed straight. This is a quarter inch thick um, hardened ground parallel bar that I know is flat. And I'll show you how to use that. On the back side of your dial caliper is a depth measurement device. So you're going to hold your straight edge. If you have a helper, this is a good time to have them hold this so you can hold this better. Um, now the really important part here is that uh, wherever you can do it on either side, but you don't want to angle this. That's not going to be an accurate reading. That's not going to be an accurate reading. So this needs to be flat. The parallel needs to be flat and the micrometer needs to be perpendicular as um, much as possible. Then just touch it, push it down until it touches and take your measurement. I have my measurement, but I have to remember to subtract the thickness of my parallel bar. Let's do some quick math here. My caliper, it's kind of hard to see, but it's showing 0.928. And we had a quarter inch thick parallel bar. So let's do that. So I have 0.928. And we're going to subtract our straight edge of 0.250. That gives us 0.678. So that's within 1,000. So if you split the difference, I was 2,000 off with the depth mic and I'm 1,000 off with the caliper. So we're going to call it good. No shims needed. Now that we know our depth is correct and we don't need any shims, we're going to use that extension again to put the final torque value on this locking nut. So you'll need a torque wrench. The specs given are between 100 and 120 foot-pounds of torque. The reason for the 20-pound range is that we will need to install this eccentric locking washer in place. So you have 20 pounds of difference to get the nut in the right position for this to slide in. It's rather difficult to show you on camera, but when you do this in person, it's very easy to see there are several um, kind of randomly placed notches inside this housing that will fit this rounded corner of this locking tab. 
So I'm going to take a little extra time at this step because this is where a lot of people, uh, including myself, have seemed to struggle. So I set my torque wrench to 90 foot-pounds. When it clicks at 90, then I get out my little locking tab and I set it in there and kind of look at where the hex, or you know, it's a double square drive, like an eight point um, inside here, and look at how that is clocked in uh, relation to the rounded side of this tab. That's the only side that really matters. And you have to line it up with the gears on the planetary and with the little notches in the housing. So once you get into 90, kind of see how much farther you need to go, then bump it up to 100. And then any time after 100 where this will line up and slide in, you're good to go. You do not have to go to 120. It just has to be over 100 and allow this to slide in all the way. This tab is magnetic and you're definitely going to want a magnet to help fish this out of there um, because you probably will have to pull it out a few times, torque it a little bit more, um, and, and try again. Do not go over 120. There should be no need for that. There's several notches in this housing that will allow this to slide in. So um, try to go a little bit less if possible. A 3 8 extension will hold and help you clock this. So you can turn it with this, but it doesn't help you at all for pulling it out. So one tip I will give you is do not ever drive this in. So if you're close to fitting in that little notch and you're like, ah, I'll just tap it in, even a little tap like this, it will get stuck in there and there's nothing to grab onto. You can't get your fingers in there. You can't get a pick in there. You can kind of put a little side pressure on the socket and it'll pull a little bit, but that's it. And a magnet won't help. So if you get this stuck in there, it's very difficult to remove um, the bowl gear from the transfer case. So it should slide right in and fit in that notch. And if it doesn't, you need to take it out Get your socket and your torque wrench, turn it a little more, and check it again. I now have the torque wrench on here, and I'm set to 100 foot-pounds, and I can tell I'm getting close to a notch that will work. So we clicked at 100. Now we're going to get the tab, the little locking tab, and see if we're close. Everyone I know has their own way of doing this. Um, this is what's worked well for me. So I take a 3 8 extension, and you come at an angle like this, and kind of rock it up as it goes through the planetary gears. Get it seated down in and sneak a screwdriver or your finger in there and boom. So it's a little hard to see but that locking tab is down in the groove of the housing. It's seated all the way in and it is not bound up at all which is what you want so if we have to take this out it won't be a problem. So I should be able to stick this socket in there, give it a wiggle which dislodged it and grab it with a magnet and bring it back out. So that kind of shows me that if I need to remove this, I can. I'm telling you this, um, I know I sound redundant, but I've had this problem before and I'm trying to help you guys avoid that. So that's why I'm spending so much time with this step. So one more time, it's going back in, rock it in, line it up in that groove, hold it in there and it's good to go. Up next is everyone's favorite part, the little star snap ring. Don't worry, it's just a snap ring. It can't hurt you, but there are a few special things to notice about it. The first thing you'll notice is that it's shaped like a star or a diamond, and that is so that you can fit it through the planetary gears. If you look right down the end of that, it creates this exact shape so that the gears ride in these little rounded portions. It also doesn't have holes, it just has little tabs. So a little pair of needle nose pliers works just fine, or your snap ring pliers with a flat tip attachment. In the instructions, it's very clear that you are to depress or compress the snap ring only until these ends butt together. If you twist it and go beyond that, it will bend the snap ring and it won't seat in there properly. And trust me, you don't want this rattling out and bouncing around inside all those spinny gears. The best advice I can give you is just work slowly. If you get frustrated, just set it down, walk away for a minute. You will need to compress it all the way to where those ends butt together. It will fit perfectly inside this needle bearing and go right through the gears and on back into the housing. Once you think you have it in place, you can let go. You can always re-grab it. It's not going to fall or disappear. 
and you want to make sure that you can see it's seated all the way against that tab the locking washer and that it's seated completely into that groove you'll notice the ends of the snap ring spread apart just like with any other snap ring and just really take your time and make sure it's in there properly okay I'm hoping that you're able to see that you can see the star shaped snap ring over top of the locking tab and you notice how it's clocked slightly different you want the corners of the snap ring to miss the grooves that the locking rings sit in um, and you'll see it when you put it in that it's it's there it can go in several different positions just make sure it's seated in there all the way I don't know if you can see the ends of it how they are separated that means it's in the groove and you can also stick your 3 8 um, extension in there and kind of wiggle around and you'll see that it won't back out now so that's uh, very important it's not difficult but do take time and get a flashlight and a little screwdriver and make sure it's seated in there all the way and once you're comfortable with that we're ready to move on to the uh, shift housing this is the shifter housing it's the main case that goes on the back of the transfer case and engages that planetary bowl gear that we just installed the next step is very simple but extremely important for the life of your overdrive unit it is the oil catch tube so this has to be installed properly or you will burn up the bearings in the front of this housing so it's just a little sheet metal tube that acts as uh, you know it catches the oil as it slings around and feeds it up to the bearing if you notice it is slightly rounded in that it will only go in one way so if you're wondering well which is up or down it's like putting a left shoe on the right foot it just won't go in there so follow the curve of the housing with the curve of the tube you kind of have to pinch it a little bit and then I just take a little rubber hammer you're not gonna bludgeon it you're just gonna tap it in you'll feel it bottom out when it's in there all the way so I was just tapping it lightly not crushing it and now you'll see um, this is how it gets installed on the back of the transfer case so it, the gear turns this way it catches the oil and it runs gravity feeds it right into that bearing so do not forget the oil tube one of the great features of the overdrive is that it is shift on the fly which means it's a synchronized shift from overdrive to direct drive and vice versa so there is a synchronizer ring fun fact this is the same synchronizer that is used in the t90 transmission so if you have a spare one of them you'll have a spare one for your overdrive if you will notice there are three little shift dogs inside this synchronizer collar and there are three little cutouts on the synchronizer ring it's important that when we assemble this they mesh together and it's all held together just like that so make sure you get everything lined up you'll feel it kind of slip in there and you'll notice that it's seated all the way inside that collar one thing you're going to want to do to make installation easier is take some good fresh clean grease and smear it around this synchronizer ring I know some people will say don't do this because the grease doesn't mix with the oil um, but this is actually in the instructions and if you've ordered one of these before they used to come already packed with grease and the synchronizer ring installed so what that's going to do is keep that from falling off as we slide this in there so you notice it fit right down in there it's it's flush with this outer synchro hub and each one of the three dogs are aligned. as we get ready to install the shift housing on the back of the transfer case you want to prepare your bolts it comes with everything you need so there are five 3 8 bolts and you'll notice there are four locking washers and one sealing washer it's like a gasketed uh, o-ring washer so make sure you take note of that a paper gasket is included make sure you use the gasket because this thickness also will affect um, the contact of the synchro hub so it's fine to use um, some permatex or whatever sort of gasket maker uh, you like to hold your gasket in place um, but you do need to use the included paper gasket with installation it only fits one way because of the uh, eccentric hole pad bolt pattern on the housing so just get your gasket on there this is the orientation that it goes in so the oil pickup tube 
is on the driver's side and the little shift rail is to the right side of the transmission. So you're gonna sneak that little oil tube past the bowl gear. You'll need to rotate it a little bit. Do not ever force it. It should just go nice and smooth. Don't force this, don't use a hammer. Just rotate it. You can rotate your uh, yoke on your transfer case or your engine a little bit to uh, make sure your gasket stays lined up and you'll feel it seat itself in and you should have no gap here. It should all be able to be done with just gentle hand pressure. Once you get to this point, just start all your bolts. I recommend starting the O-ring washer bolt first. That way you don't mess up and put it in the wrong spot. It goes right here by the shift rail and the manual outlines that very well. So just get it in there and you'll feel it grab in the hole. And every one of these should be able to be started by hand. Um, it is a good idea to chase the threads on your transfer case um, before you do this. I did that earlier and that just makes it nice and clean and easy to start all these bolts. So once you know they're all started by hand, you're in good shape. Uh, you don't ever want to use an impact gun on these bolts. This is just an aluminum housing and you're just going into the cast iron holes on the transfer case. So I just go through and get them just moderately tight with a ratchet and then we'll come back through with a torque wrench. These little guys get torqued to 30 foot pounds. Try to go in a star pattern so it's nice and even. Do not over torque or you will crush the gaskets that are in between the pieces of the housing. The overdrive unit install is complete. Let's just take a minute to look at how beautiful this thing is. We have the overdrive installed, but now how are we gonna shift it? Don't worry, Kaiser Willys has you covered on that as well. Installing the shifter is very straightforward. We're gonna remove these front two bolts on the transmission top cover on the passenger side. Over top of the hole you're going to set the two included little bushings and just place the shifter bracket and lever on top of the bushings and use the included longer bolts because we're going through all this extra material. There is a flat washer and a lock washer with that as well. Start them by hand to buzz them down just gently tight snug with the impact gun and I'll come back through and torque them with the ratchet next we'll take the included little heim joint and it has a lock nut on it so thread that on all the way this should just be threaded in by hand and go ahead and thread this in most of the way you will want this uh, in the straight up and down position like that. Then just take a 7 16 wrench and tighten that lock nut. This doesn't have to be crazy tight. It really can't go anywhere. Um, so just give that a little snug. Next up you want to grab your shift rod. That's this piece. Thread the clevis on the end. I added a 3 8 24 nut on mine uh, so I can lock this in place. It's not required but I like how it kind of holds everything together just a little bit better. And this is the orientation that it gets installed at. Front um, and slide the pin through the clevis and the shift lever. If you're working inside the vehicle or underneath the vehicle, that might dictate which way you push the pin through. Uh, the side doesn't matter as long as you're able to get it through. And then install the included cotter pin and bend that over. So think about that as you're installing it. If it's easier for you to push the pin through this way and put the uh, the cotter pin in the back that's fine as well now we can connect the rear portion of the shift lever so i'm going to use this back hole it has two different hole locations just slide the bolt through and it comes with a nylon lock nut these are both 7 16 you can just snug that up it doesn't need to be super tight um, it will rotate on that little ball joint and the nylon 
lock nut will keep it from vibrating loose. Here's what it looks like all together. Depending on your specific application, you'll need to adjust the shift lever so it doesn't hit your firewall when it's in overdrive and that it doesn't come down too far if you have a center console or cup holders. Um, so you just have to adjust that for your personal needs. That can be done by threading the clevis in so this is shorter. You also have a little bit of adjustment back here. Um, this is a smaller thread so I'd recommend maintaining quite a bit of thread engagement here and make the bulk of your adjustments up here. So you'll just have to play with that so that it clears. The overdrive is mounted, the shifter is installed, there's only one thing left to do. Install this awesome shift knob. I've been waiting all day for this. How cool is that? There's just nothing quite like having four shifters in your Jeep. Now that we have it all together, you should be able to test the engagement. Do be gentle to make sure that nothing's bound up, but you should be able to fairly easily push it forward into overdrive and you'll feel the detent in this. It should uh, have a nice positive snap and go into gear. And same way with bringing it back into direct drive. Should click and lock in there quite nicely. Keeping your overdrive properly lubricated is what's going to make it last. These things have a lot of spinning parts, a lot of small bearings, and get a lot of heat. So keeping the oil level up to where it should be and using good high quality oil is what's going to make this thing last. I recommend you use a good GL4 90 weight gear oil and keep an eye on the levels. You know these things leak a lot. If your transfer case is leaky, check it all the time. Overfill it a little bit if you can and just keep an eye on the oil level because this thing needs a lot of good clean oil to make it last. Once you have the fluid topped off to where it should be, it's time to get everything oiled up real good before you take it out on the road. So to do that, uh, put your transmission in first gear, transfer case in neutral, and engage the overdrive. That will uh, get this spinning nice and fast, but you won't move because you're in neutral, and that'll get oil up in that sling tube and everything lubricated in there. So just let it run for a few minutes with the transmission in gear and the transfer case in neutral. After about 100 miles, I would recommend checking these bolts, the 5 3 8 bolts on the back. So remember 30 foot pounds. Just go back through and make sure nothing's leaking and that they're all torqued properly. Then you should be good to go. Um, you can uh, change the fluid just like you normally would. Just keep an eye on the level, like I said. I'll before. put a product link for the overdrive in the description of this video. So all the parts that we used here are available at Kaiser Willys. Um, please use code REDEYEGARAGE10 to save 10% at checkout on all the Jeep parts that you might need. And uh, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a demo video on the road um, of how you shift it. I can show you the RPM differences in direct and overdrive um, and just kind of go over some of the operation driving characteristics with the overdrive.